Welcome to um, this um, edition of Evidence of Greatness. Um, in this um, edition, we're going to talk about an article that's entitled, What is Presupposition Accommodation Again? Um, and this article was written by Kai Van Fintel. Um, and I'm just going to give you a warning if you decide to read this article. Um, it is dense. It's really, it, it's really thick. Um, but it's really, really valuable and really important. So I've tried to pull out some of the most um, important things. Um, and then I'll obviously talk a little bit about how this is related to um, solution-focused brief therapy as well. But I think one of the things that's really important to mention as I begin this process is that um, we view solution-focused brief therapy as a language and therefore um, linguistic properties and tools and techniques, um, those things have some really direct implications for solution-focused brief therapy. And if you've followed the work of Elliot Connie and me and um, Cecil Walker, you will notice um, that we have started talking about presuppositions quite a bit. Um, and so I thought it would be useful for us to give a little background on what presuppositions are, um, and how then we could use them purposefully um, in solution-focused brief therapy. Um, so without further ado, let's jump into um, this article. Um, so one of the things that he talks about is this idea of presupposition accommodation. And what this is, is it's a, the process by which the context of a conversation is adjusted. And it's adjusted, this accommodation occurs quietly and without fuss, right? So it's not something that as we negotiate with one another that we overtly talk about, but it's something that happens kind of as a side process. It happens quietly, we don't debate about it. Um, and this, this process is of adjustment is the acceptance of an utterance of a sentence that imposes certain requirements on the context in which it is um, processed. So what this means, and you can see here, this is why I mentioned that it's kind of a dense process, but what this means is um, a speaker introduces some new information that carries with it um, an assumption, right? And that assumption um, is then accommodated, it's accepted by the listener without much fuss, right? This, this accommodation happens quietly. Now, he's gonna go into um, how does this happen and why does this happen and what's the utility of this? But we need to kind of first talk about this, this um, negotiation that happens. And from a solution focused perspective, one of the things that I would say is we oftentimes use the phrase, it's a co-construction. And presupposition accommodation is part of this, um, of this co-construction, right? This adjustment that happens, these assumptions that get built into the conversation, they get accepted by the listener um, without fuss, right? This is how co-construction occurs. And one of the things that he talks about is that there's common ground. There's things that we have agreed upon, right? So the common ground of any conversation at any given time is a set of propositions that the participants in the conversation at that time are mutually assume to be taken for granted, right? So we don't need to talk about these things anymore or clarify them anymore because we have agreed that they exist, that we understand each other, um, they can be taken for granted. So anything that we add to the conversation can be built on this foundation of agreed upon assumptions. So when we add a presupposition, when we introduce some new information that includes a presupposition, if it gets accommodated easily, it gets added to that common ground, right? So one example that he gave of this is Margaret broke the piano, right? There is no presupposition that the piano is broken um, or sorry, there is a presupposition. I don't know why I said there isn't. There's a, in this sentence, there's two presuppositions. There's a presupposition that the piano broke and there is a presupposition that someone, in this case, Margaret, broke the piano, right? So if I say Margaret broke the piano, then 
if the listener accepts that and just says, huh, how'd she break it, right? They have accommodated that presupposition. So that's what we're talking about. So this, this accommodation is really how co-construction begins to occur. So next, then there are informative presuppositions, right? And an example of an informative presupposition is, I'm sorry that I'm late. I had to take my daughter to the doctor, right? If there wasn't part of that common ground before that the speaker had a daughter, then it include, then this includes the presupposition of, I had to take my daughter. This means that the presupposition is the speaker has a daughter, right? So we can, we can add this infor information as a presupposition. This couldn't be uttered without having previous common ground. Now, this is where the debate became um, part of the process that Don Fintel talks about. He believes in what they call this common ground theory. And he said, so if there is such a thing as an informative presupposition, does that mean that the common ground theory is we throw that out? And that's what most of the article then is about, right? So he then cites Lewis's rule of accommodation. And he says, if at a given time, something is said that requires a presupposition, right? And if that presupposition is acceptable, and if that presupposition is not presupposed before that time, that means there must be certain limits on the existence of that presupposition. So basically, all of that gets down to this means that people are willing and able to expand the common ground of their conversation as the conversation develops, right? So this is really important for us as solution-focused free therapists is that people can insert new information. The speakers can, in, can provide informative presuppositions. And we as solution-focused therapists can ask presuppositional questions. And each time that happens, the common ground or the co-construction is expanded, right? So in order for that common ground theory to be satisfied, the presuppositional requirement must be updated as it's performed and not necessarily as the, um, the presuppositions are uttered, right? Um, so those, so this is where he's building an argument for as statements are added, I can listen to the statement, I can accommodate that and add it to the common ground and then accept the basis of the presupposition. And that's oftentimes what our clients are asked to do, right? When we say, what is the very first thing that you would notice, right? We assume that there is, that they would notice something. And we assume that there is a first thing that they would notice. So they then have to accommodate, I guess they would notice something in order to answer that question, right? So they're consistently adding to what is the common ground with each one of our questions. And we are constantly adding to what is the common ground as they supply us with informational presuppositions, right? So we're constantly growing what is the common ground. So then we want to talk about a couple of things of common ground and participant belief, right? So these are two direct quotes from the article. And he says, common ground is an object that is constituted entirely by the beliefs of the participants in the conversation. And since people can change their beliefs, at least to some extent in response to other people's actions, the common ground is more easily changed than a physical object and can thus, in the right circumstances, be adjectively, quietly, and without fuss, right? So what this means, this is such a powerful statement. What this means is we oftentimes in solution-focused therapy say change happens through language, right? And this is exactly what he's saying here is that because the common ground is based on my beliefs and through questions and through informative accommodations, I can change the way that I the beliefs that I have about the common ground, therefore my beliefs change, therefore I change, right? 
So this provides an argument that language creates reality. This provides an argument that says change occurs through language. The way we language something is very, very important. And this second quote here, it says, presupposing is thus not a mental attitude like believing, but it is rather a linguistic deposition, a disposition to have to behave in one's use of language as one had certain beliefs or were making certain assumptions, right? So through language, the beliefs change, not necessarily the beliefs informing the language. So this is really, really valuable because it's explaining how does change occur from a solution-focused perspective when all we do is talk, right? When I ask a question that includes a presupposition and my client accommodates that presupposition, they take it on and they answer the question as though they, they have added that to the common ground, they have accepted that presupposition as consistent with their beliefs. And therefore, change is occurring, right? So this is hugely important because it's explaining how does change occur? So he then goes on and asks the question, when does accommodation not occur, right? And this also has really important implications because he goes on to say, accommodation is limited by the natural requirement that the participants will only adjust the context quietly and without fuss if the accommodated claim is not one that they would wish to debate, either because they trust the speaker or because they do not care about what the speaker is saying. As a corollary, when a presupposition is actually taken to be false in the common ground, i.e. when everyone takes it to be false and believes that everyone else to do so as well, then accommodation is unlikely to occur. So again, one of the requirements is for accommodation to happen is that it happens quietly, it happens without fuss, right? It's something that makes sense. And in order for that to occur, then it has to be something that the client wouldn't debate. So this is where we as clinicians need to be really, really careful, right? Because we don't wanna make presuppositions that are so big that the client's like, no, that's not true. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't believe that, right? Because now we're having a conversation about the assertion rather than the context of what's going on that we're trying to build. So we want to ensure that our presuppositions build off of what the common ground that's already there and that they don't take too big of leaps, right? But one of the things that you, you've probably heard us talk about is that throughout the conversation, the presuppositions can get bigger. If I buy into, I have hope. If I buy into that that hope is going to show up in certain ways and that I'll notice, then I can start making, um, presuppositions that say, since you're noticing, can you tell me what that would mean about you, right? Now we're into meaning making, but it's based on several presuppositions that have been accommodated previously. So our presuppositions over the course of the conversation can get bigger and bigger. So also one of the things that he says is when the time of the utterance is in present tense, it's simply not true and cannot be accommodated until later, right? since we all know that I have a daughter, but some people don't know. So we can't introduce something that some people don't know with a presupposition that's way too big, right? So we want to be really careful about our presuppositions because again, if change occurs through presupposition accommodation, we don't want to introduce something that is debatable or that they don't believe in or that they can't buy into, right? So that these accommodations need to happen step by step. So this is one of the things I think is really important. It says, what gets accommodated depends on the best guess of the hearers about what the speaker might have intended as the adjustment to the common ground that would admit the asserted sentence. So we're constantly, as the conversation is building, we're constantly making judgments around what did the speaker mean to say, right? And then because of our best guess, then we add our next utterance, right? And that common ground is adjusted based on what I think that I heard. 
So this is why we want to use our client's words really directly, right? As we make presuppositions, we want to embed those presuppositions with the client's words. Therefore, it's not our best guess about what they mean, but instead they get to clarify and they get to expand that common ground each time they insert their own words, right? So each of our utterances, each of our presuppositions should build on their own words. Therefore, it's their meaning, not our best guess of what we think they mean. So this, again, has huge implications for why we do therapy the way we do it. We use their words so that what gets accommodated is dependent on their beliefs, not on ours. Okay? So then the final thing that he kind of mentions <clears throat> is some cautions. And he says, whoa, 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 not so fast. You can't just conclude and be like, see, isn't that wonderful? He adds these two things. One should not presuppose something that is properly put forward as a debatable assertion. So again, he just kind of reiterates, don't presuppose something that somebody's going to debate, right? And the second thing he says is empirically, we know what governs the choice between presupposing and asserting a piece of information. And that distinction is only presuppose if it is not controversial, right? So we can assert new information. We can say, I have a grandmother, right? Or we can presuppose, I need to pick up my grandmother. That, that assumes that I have a grandmother, right? So how we make the decision between asserting something and presupposing something is if it isn't controversial, is if it isn't going to cause a debate. Now, again, that has such huge implications for solution-focused therapy because we don't want to be coercing our clients into believing something or doing something or prescribing something to them, right? So we want to make our presuppositional presuppositions undebatable. And the way that we do that is we stick to the common ground. We ask them within the context of what they've already provided, we use their words. So what makes successful presuppositions also makes successful solution-focused brief therapy. So I hope that that was helpful to you. I hope that um, that helps you understand why we talk about solution-focused brief therapy as a language. I hope that helps you understand why we're so cautious about using the client's words, why we're so cautious about not presupposing something that's so big that's outside of the realm of the client. Um, and so there's huge implications. Obviously, presuppositions happen in everyday language and conversations, but we can use them really purposefully in solution-focused brief therapy. So um, let me know what your thoughts are around using presuppositions in our therapeutic work.